I'm Vicki Hogarth and welcome to Southwest Magazine. My guests today are researcher and assistant curator of geology and paleontology at the New Brunswick Museum, Matt Stimson, and local prospector Dave Stevens. Thank you both for being here today. Thanks for having us. Thank you. We're going to talk about a trace fossil, something that was discovered in the St. Andrews area recently. Can you give people who don't know about this discovery an idea of what it is and why it's so important? Sure. So the fossil that was found was a trace fossil. A trace fossil is evidence of life being preserved as a rock in a fossil without having the animal itself. So we typically think of fossils being the bones of animals or possibly a fossilized leaf or a shell. In this case, it's the tracks and the trails, or in this case, the burrows of an animal that betray the presence of an animal and tell us something about a local ecosystem and how animals were living, what they were doing millions of years ago without the critter. Okay, and what exactly would this critter have been that made this trace fossil and, and how long ago would this have happened? Well, the rocks in San Andrews area are from the, the, what we call the late Devonian period. So it's somewhere between uh, 360 and 390 million years old. Um, the details were still working out. The fossil itself is a burrow, uh, something we call either Beaconites, uh, but we're still working on some of the details, still studying the fossil itself. But essentially it's a burrow about this wide, so the animal was about that wide, tunneling through the sediments uh, when the world looked very different than today. And the animal that would have made this burrow, um, we're still working on the details, but typically it's this particular type of burrow is thought to be made by either an annelid, something like a worm, or some sort of arthropod, like a, like a bug. So we know there are limited bugs walking around on land. Uh, the worms were really tiny at the time, so we're leaning more towards an arthropod, possibly a millipede. Uh, we know that really large millipedes lived at that time, something called Eoarthropleura. Uh, something that's about half a meter in length and, you know, yay wide or so. This one would have been smaller, smaller, this wide. Um, but it, it was probably made by something like that. Smaller. So this wide, though, this to wide. me, that sounds pretty big. It's fairly small in the fossil record. If you move ahead to the Carboniferous period uh, 300 million years ago, millipedes could be up to two meters in length and up to half a meter wide. So it's relatively tiny for the time period. But in the Devonian period, this would have been the ancestors of these arthropleura called Eoarthropleura, or early arthropleura, living in the Devonian period, uh, scurrying the shorelines of ancient rivers, and in this case, probably tunneling into the sediments and leaving behind these burrows and trace fossils. So the insects that lived in this area back then, were t why would they have been so big in the first place? What would it have been that made them this enormous, by our standards anyway? Well, there's not a lot of research that's been done into the bugs during the Devonian period, but what we can say about the Carboniferous period, slightly younger, is that oxygen levels reached a maximum uh, which are about 15% higher than today. And we think that because oxygen was higher, bugs got big. I'll, I'll spare you all the details, the, the biochemical <laughs> details for that. But So how was this discovery made? Who came across it? And, and how would you know if it was, say you were a citizen scientist who comes across something, what would you know to look for? Well, the story starts with, uh, with Dave Stevens. So Dave gave us a call at the museum and said, I think I found a few fossils. So why don't yeah, you take over story, and tell Dave. that side? Well, I found a, <clears throat> found a couple of things down there. One appeared to be a, a, a leaf. I still am not sure if it is or not. Um, but the others are fossilized worm trails, worm tracks. And uh, I called Matt and I said, this might be interesting. Uh, at the time, I think most of the life was assumed to be in the, in the oceans. And these looked like they might not have been in the oceans. So uh, Matt came down and uh, he and Olivia got up and found the actual uh, burrow. And to be honest, I don't think I would have recognized it if I'd seen it. Um, but it was getting them down here to look around in these rocks that didn't appear to be particularly fossiliferous. Okay, and for people who are, are wondering whereabouts you found this, was this very close to the ocean? Can you create the sort of atmosphere yeah, you were in that, where you discovered it? Well, it's near the height of the tide. Uh, it's the big outcrop just before you get to the campground as you go down Water Street. Uh, it's in the tilted red sediments, uh, the Perry Formation. Uh, they're tilted because of a, basically a continental plate ramming into the North American plate uh, millions of years ago. Uh, and the sediments, which had been flat-lying, were buckled by the force. 
these things happen very, very slowly, but you can imagine the force of continental plates coming together would be pretty remarkable. Yeah. So we have these, these tilted Devonian uh, sandstones and uh, not a whole lot in them for fossils except for plant fragments and these little worm tubes. Wow. So then what happens with this, this trace fossil? What do you do with it at the museum after it's excavated? Well, as Dave said, um, our research associate uh, and, and uh, a master's student at St. Mary's University, Olivia King, who's been working with us at the museum for many years, uh, made the discovery of this particular fossil that was of interest. So what Dave found were indeed fossilized worm burrows. So the Perry Formation, as we call it, the red sandstones in the St. Andrews area, and they actually extend down into Maine as well, uh, were deposited during the Devonian period, a very dry area in this part of the world at the time. We were south of the equator. And uh, these sandstones were being deposited in what we call big alluvial fans. Think Death Valley, very dry, arid climates with rivers crisscrossing the environment. And there were some plants, uh, Dave's right, there were definitely some plant fossils he's pointed out to us down on the same shoreline. Um, sticks of wood and branching stems and so on. Uh, so there was some life around and what Dave found were indeed worm burrows. But this other fossil that, that Olivia found is, is quite a bit larger and very unique and it's, it's larger than other specimens we already have in the museum. So it tells us that these animals were sort of burrowing and living on the sides of these river channels uh, in southern New Brunswick during the Devonian. So uh, teaming up with the New Brunswick Geological Survey, uh, Dave, myself, and Stephen Hines, uh, one of the uh, geologists with the province, went down and excavated the fossil out uh, using rock saws and hammers and chisels. We got permission both from the community, the municipality, as well as the, uh, the chiefs locally, and um, uh, we collected this material. It's now back at the museum. So it will be studied, it will be uh, researched by researchers, not just locally here, but also further abroad. Science works as a team. We very rarely work in isolation, so we bring in experts from all over the world. So we'll team up with people in the United States and the UK and other places to, to better study these, this particular fossil. Um, it'll be cataloged, it'll be curated and protected and uh, accessioned into the provincial collections for future generations. Wow, and what does a fossil like this tell you about, I mean, when we think about the history of this part of the world, we think hundreds, maybe thousands of years ago, but what does it tell you about what life was like here so long ago? Well, fossils are rare on a good day. And although plant fossils are quite common in certain time periods, like the Carboniferous, they're quite rare in the Devonian period. And we have a, a beautiful outcrop of, of fossils and rocks up in the northern part of the province, which give us a really good idea of life during the Devonian period, much older rocks though, than what we see down here in, in southwestern New Brunswick. So uh, every fossil in these, these red sandstones in southern New Brunswick are, are, are very important because every one of them is a clue as to what life was like back then. Uh, it may seem very common, but as a common fossil, but it could be something quite unique and quite rare. So every piece of the puzzles is critical to understanding one more piece of life at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, trace fossils are very common, relatively speaking, compared to the animals that made them. And if you think of uh, even today, if you go out in the woods today, the most common type of life in the forest are plants. Mm -hmm. But in terms of animals, one animal could leave thousands of footprints theoretically in the course of its life. Uh, we have these step counters today to see how many steps we've made. Well, imagine in nature, every one of those steps has the potential to leave a footprint. Mm -hmm. and, but they only leave one animal. So that one animal could become prey for some other animal, uh, somebody else's dinner. It could die of natural causes, but eventually it's going to rot and decay and break down. Uh, the bones are going to be scattered about, or the bits of the, the arthropod or bug will be scattered. But the chances of preserving some of those footprints are actually pretty good. If you think of thousands of footprints, if only a fraction get preserved, that's still more than the body that left the footprints. So footprints give us a really good idea about what sort of life was around at the time. So mm -hmm. these burrows are a really good example of that. Dave is obviously a great resource for the New Brunswick Museum and we are lucky to have him locally to discover these kinds of things. What are some of the other discoveries you've had in this particular area in the, in the Charlotte County region over the years? Anything that comes to mind that is of particular well, we, interest? Uh, there were the clams, the Bocobet clams, little, little tiny bivalves. I don't know if they're really clams, but <laughs> <laughs> they're little tiny bivalves. 
Uh, those are up in the museum now. And over in Walwig, uh, bracket pods and part of a trilobite. And it, it's, it's a case of once you really get looking closely at your environment, you start to see the things that are there. Whereas if you go by at 60 miles an hour, uh, there's a good chance you're gonna miss it. Right. Um, the other stuff that I found is mostly uh, mineralogical and that's outside the realm of fossils, but uh, still a lot of fun. Um, some teenagers this summer were actually two of your citizen scientists who discovered dragonfly wings, correct me if I'm wrong, mm, in right. New Brunswick. I'd love for you to touch on what that discovery was and also how these two teenagers were able to play such an important role in the discovery. Sure, yeah, no, that was a, a really important discovery uh, in the Grand Lake area. So citizen scientists are really important and we rely on them in New Brunswick and uh, Atlantic Canada and in the field of paleontology as a whole uh, very heavily. Uh, there's only so many uh, expert eyes out there and we spend a lot of time in the lab and we can only be in one place at a time. So rock falls happen all over the province, on the shorelines, on the side of rivers and lakes. And new fossils have a potential with every rock fall in sedimentary rocks to, to be exposed to, to weather and nature. So as soon as a fossil is exposed, it starts to weather away, it starts to deteriorate. So we can't be everywhere at, a to at, at once. So we rely on other people to make discoveries and bring them to our attention such that they can be studied. These two boys are just that. Um, Luke Allen and Rowan Norad, both high school boys in Halifax, uh, cottage on Grand Lake, and although they've made many other important discoveries in the last few years, and we've, uh, I've had the, the privilege of working with them, uh, they've gone beyond scavenger hunting for fossils to real citizen science. They're writing it down, they're documenting. Uh, they've got you know, leather-bound notebooks and field notebooks. They're recording what layer of rock the fossils are coming from. They're making maps as to where the fossils are being found. And they're reporting them all to the museum. They have permits now, paleontology, amateur paleontology permits to collect and study and research uh, fossils. And, and this summer, uh, we published one of those fossils, which is a dragonfly wing. It's about yay long. The whole animal would have a wingspan of about 35 centimeters. And as soon as my, my field partner, Olivia King, and I discovered this, uh, or saw this, this dragonfly wing, we thought, gosh, that looks like a dragonfly wing, but I'm not a fossil dragonfly expert. So again, we work with other people and contacted researchers at the National Museum in Paris. And uh, Dr. Olivier uh, Bethau is one of the world leading experts on fossilized dragonflies and said, yes, this is, this is a fossil dragonfly wing and it's something very new. It's a new genus and a new species. So uh, we published a paper through the winter that just came out, a scientific paper and peer reviewed journal. Both of the boys are co-authors on that journal. So we're keeping them, uh, keeping them involved in the science every step along the way. And uh, the, the species name is named after one of the boys' family. So we named the genus uh, Brunelopteron after a local researcher uh, and uh, research associate at the New Brunswick Museum who passed away about a year ago, uh, Paul Brunel, who really increased our knowledge of fossilized, or sorry, modern day dragonflies in Atlantic Canada as a whole, not just New Brunswick, but Atlantic Canada as a whole. And so we felt it fitting to name the genus after him. And then the species is named after Rowan Norad's father and, and their family, so it's Brunelopteron noradi. Wow. So. Is that fossil in Paris now being researched? It's on its way home. Okay, uh, but wow. But yes, it's currently on vacation in Paris. <laughs> I mean, being studied in Paris. Uh, but it is on its way home, yeah. So it will be coming back to the New Brunswick Museum to be curated and, uh, and protected in our provincial collections. Now, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how people like those two teenagers, obviously someone like Dave Stevens is more knowledgeable, but how does the average person get involved in these discoveries? And then Dave, what advice would you give to them in terms of how to do a discovery properly? What are the do's and don'ts? Well, the, the, the do's and don'ts, I think Matt's covered pretty well as, as to what you should and shouldn't do. Um, you shouldn't be out collecting without a permit in, in the case of fossils. Um, but discovering no matter what it is, uh, you really have to tune yourself to your subject, whether it's fossils, minerals, botany, wild mushrooms, whatever it is. And you'll find that after time, you have a sense based on experience of where to look and what to look for. 
I can spot chanterelles now at quite a distance. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't, well, I don't even know what that is. What oh, is that? They're a wild edible mushroom. <laughs> okay. And a very, very good one. All right. Uh, oh. <laughs> but it, it's, uh, I think anybody it, living in New Brunswick, surrounded by the kind of beautiful countryside we have, is missing a lot if they're not out there exploring, mm -hmm. even for just for fun. All right. And then what would be the path be of the trace fossil here? What happens next? Well, just, just to add to Dave, uh, Dave's comment, um, you know, especially with COVID, uh, a lot of people are getting outdoors. Mm -hmm. And we were just discussing this yeah. this morning, actually, that yeah. there, there's more people going outdoors, exploring our, uh, you know, New Brunswick uh, natural sites and coastlines and uh, parks and so on um, than, you know, in the past. So more eyes means there's a better chance that fossils are going to be found. Mm -hmm. And some of those are going to be important. Um, and it might be an important fossil, it might be a common fossil, but without an expert eye to uh, distinguish what should be in the provincial collections and what isn't, as soon as a fossil is, is removed from its natural habitat, if you will, or where it's discovered, it loses a lot of data. So it's really important for it to be studied in place. But you know, as we mentioned earlier, it's, it's really important uh, that people bring these fossils to the attention of the New Brunswick Museum so that they can be uh, studied can be examined and we can determine whether it's something important or not. So although it's illegal to collect fossils without a permit, technically, um, we do have professional and amateur permits, both. Um, we do have what's known as the duty to report. So it is important for people when they find something, let us know, just take a picture, document where it came from. And if possible, uh, if it's loose on a beach, you know, it's, it's okay to bring it into us and show us at the museum as well. Um, and hopefully it's something important and hopefully there'll be beyond the news. And is it e easy enough as just sending a photo to the museum or giving a phone call? Yeah, we, we get work? reports on the Facebook page via email, phone call, all the time. Um, I usually recommend that people send a photo over and I can usually filter out what is a fossil, what's not a fossil, and whether it's important or not via photos. But uh, often enough, it's something that we want to have a look at because it, it could be something really special. Can I ask a little bit about your own specialty as a PhD student at St. Mary's uh, studying paleontology? Obviously, sure. that's still a big field. Uh, what is your, your, your area of focus? My area of focus is the Carboniferous period, so between 300 and 350 million years ago, give or take a day, and mostly looking at footprints. So I like the trace fossil that came out of uh, St. Andrews. I look at footprints and tracks and trails and other types of trace fossils as a proxy for biodiversity. So I'm looking at reconstructing ecosystems and biodiversity, what animals were around at the time, uh, even though we don't have the critters themselves. Bones are extremely rare. The animals, the bugs being fossilized are extremely rare, but their footprints, although still rare, are more common than the bodies. So I use the footprints and the tracks and trails to reconstruct ecosystems from millions of years ago. And for both of you, what is it about New Brunswick that you find so interesting? There's just so much out there to explore. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> there is no end to it. It really, from botany to biology to paleontology, geology, mineralogy, we have minerals here that uh, are only known from here and one other place in Canada. Okay. Babingtonite was first found in Canada, right out here in Diggity Wash. That's right. Uh, there's a real odd duck down on the Mascarene uh, called Muschetovite which I had no idea what it was. I had to send it up to UNB to be analyzed. There's surprises out there and very, very few people looking, which means that we have a, an open season <laughs> for uh, discoveries, which is always fun. And, and in geology in particular, I mean, we have a, if you look at a geological map of the province, it's really a mosaic of geology. We give a different color or different texture <coughs> each unique unit of rocks and unique age of rocks and rather than be all colored one color like other places in the world it's really a mosaic and the geology is very complex and there's really not enough people looking so no. the more people are out there looking the more pairs of eyes the more things are going to be found so which makes it really exciting because every time we go out in the field we see something we haven't seen before right what are some of the more fascinating periods of new brunswick's history way back history and and how does this trace fossil from this area fit into that right um well i mean we have roughly a billion years of earth's history in southern new brunswick alone um all you know a lot of it within the stonehammer unesco global geopark um we have uh, stromatolites some of the 
oldest life in Atlantic Canada that date back to about a billion years. Not the oldest in the fossil record, but some of the oldest in Atlantic Canada. Um, these buildups of microbial mats and algae. Um, we have uh, you know, some of North America's oldest amphibian footprints. We have uh, reptile trackways and fish and all kinds of neat fossils. We have some of the oldest um, fossilized and most complete fossilized sharks up in the Camelton area found by uh, my friend and colleague Dr. Randy Miller in the past. So there's such a, a wide array of geology and different environments being preserved that yeah, we're likely to find something unique in this province. Um, what is the next step with this trace fossil? For people who want to follow the journey of what happens once something is excavated, can they see it somewhere? Is it being analyzed? Where does it go and how does it end up finding its way into a piece of the history books? Right, so we have uh, the provincial collections at the New Brunswick Museum and we've got roughly 40,000 specimens of both minerals, which Dave has donated a lot of specimens to, um, as well as fossils. So. Uh, I think we have roughly somewhere around 22,000 fossils now, something like that. And it will become part of that provincial collection, so it will be protected uh, under legislation for all future generations, uh, available for researchers and scientists to come and look at in the future. And currently right now we have a team of, of researchers from around the province that are uh, both here in the province at the Geological Survey of New Brunswick. Uh, myself, Dave is involved in the scientific paper as well. Uh, Olivia King at St. Mary's University, but also researchers from outside the province who will be working on this, will be studying it, will be publishing it in a scientific journal article, hopefully in the next year or so. Okay, I think there's going to be a lot of people at home that are inspired to get involved in c citizens, being a citizen scientist. What would their path be to do that? Can you just do that? Do you have to have a discovery first, or can they get in touch with the museum and, and get the 411 on that? Well, anybody can enjoy nature. Anybody can get out and walk a beach. Anybody can walk a river bank um, and look at rocks. Um, if somebody wants to get more formally involved, uh, certainly contact us at the museum. Uh, we always accept volunteers and, and we're looking for you know, amateur paleontologists to go out and, and collect and, and keep an eye open. Uh, we have amateur paleontology permits you know, issued to individuals who have the skills they need to document fossils properly around the province already. Um, but you know we're always looking for more pairs of eyes and people to be more formally involved in the, the research associate programs and the amateur programs. So um, anybody can go out and enjoy fossils and find them and just document and uh, send us photos and keep us informed as to what they're finding. And for people who haven't been to the New Brunswick Museum before, what are some of the permanent collections that are, are most intriguing and bring the most visitors? Well, I'm not sure the numbers for most visitors, but uh, we certainly have a lot of collections at the Provincial Museum, at the New Brunswick Museum. Um, in addition to paleontology, we have, the, in, in my section, geology, paleontology, we have uh, basically a rock collection looking at the different types of rocks. We have a mineral collection, the different types of minerals in the province and beyond, fossils. Um, but we also have zoological collections, animals uh, and bugs and and different animal, uh, the, the life of the province, the zoology of the province. We have botanical and mycological collections. Um, so a lot of research is currently being done on the, the mushrooms in the province and what the diversity of mushrooms in the province is, as well as lichens and other types of natural history. We have the humanities collection, which involves uh, um, lots of human artifacts, cultural artifacts, everything from, uh, from statues to books to furniture and, and way beyond. Not my specialty, but <laughs> but an extensive collection of, of humanity, uh, humanities and cultural artifacts. I'm getting the sense that you might be involved in the mushroom research as well. No, I'm <laughs> not actually. I, I, I just do that for fun, to take a break from prospecting. All right. Are there any uh, fossils or trace fossils that you're looking at right now? Is there anything currently in the works that maybe you can't reveal the location of at this moment? Well, we try not to reveal too many of the locations themselves of fossils because um, uh, the fossil sites are just as important as the fossils because they will continue to yield new fossils uh, as you know, shorelines continue to erode away. But we're looking at uh, fossils all over the province. I'm spending a great deal of time uh, looking at the southern part of the province, the Bay of Fundy shoreline, because of the age of the rocks. Um, I was recently up in the Bathurst area looking at rocks up in that area from similar time periods. So there, there's a lot of research going on. We have researchers from uh, um, in the Norton area looking at, at plant fossils, 
uh, people coming from Saskatchewan and South Carolina, Maine, and other places. Uh, not currently here at the moment because of COVID, but but um, who are doing a lot of research on, on plant fossils from the early Carboniferous. So lots of research going on. Okay, and for the viewers yeah. that are watching in this particular region in, in, in southwest New Brunswick, I know we've talked about the do's and don'ts, what to do and to call if we do discover something, but are there particularly areas you'd recommend going to if you're, you're hoping to discover something? Well, any, any shoreline that has sedimentary rocks, and sedimentary rocks are sandstones, mudstones, uh, not things like granite and, and metamorphic rocks. Um, if you're looking for fossils in particular, um, you know, there, if it's a sandstone, there's always a chance that there might be a fossil in it. Um, there are some great places to go where you can, can actually take some tours. Um, you can uh, take some of the tours out of St. John. Um, out to, to look at some of the stromatolites in the Cape and Rage area. There are geology tours where experts will take you out and show you some of the fossils. Um, but yeah, any shoreline, if people are out looking, they can, there's a chance that they might find something important. Well, I appreciate you both being here today. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. More than welcome. Thanks for having us. My guests today have been Matt Stimson of the New Brunswick Museum and prospector Dave Stevens. I'm Vicki Hogarth. You're watching Southwest Magazine.